um, the title of my talk is Ongoing Controversy of the Association of Hypoglycemia and Cardiovascular Disease. And I want to start by defining the problem and explain how the controversy began. And I want to very briefly, because I've only got 20 minutes, which is a short uh, time, just to uh, show you an example of an experimental study uh, and a clinical study that our group has carried out and put to you the way in which hypoglycemia might be causing these problems. So we know, of course, that hypoglycemia has an impact on multiple organ systems. Everybody uh, on this call knows that hypoglycemia affects the brain and indeed physiologically uh, mammals and humans are included uh, have devised very powerful uh, physiological systems which keep uh, glucose being delivered to the brain. But of course, hypoglycemia in diabetes is an artificial pharmacologically induced situation uh, and it can disrupt the uh, physiology. So it can affect the brain, uh, as we know, by causing cognitive dysfunction, seizures, comas, and indeed, rarely brain damage. Uh, indeed, hypoglycemia creates a lot of fear amongst our patients and their relatives. Uh, we also know that people can crash their cars and therefore damage their bodies in that way. But hypoglycemia can also cause seizures, uh, and that is associated with spinal fractures. But what I want to concentrate on, which is marked in red, is the evidence which has emerged over the last 10 to 20 years to suggest that hypoglycemia might be damaging the cardiovascular system. And my high, overall hypothesis, which we've advanced for some years, is that perhaps uh, the side effects of the treatment uh, overcome the benefits of tight glucose control in those who need intensive therapy, particularly with insulin. So let's consider how this controversy uh, started. And I want to uh, show you this forest plot, which is adapted from a review by uh, uh, Professor Ray back in 2009. Now, as this all audience knows, the UK PDS essentially confirmed the results of the DCCT and showed that a tight control well, relatively tight control, it wasn't actually that tight, uh, in newly diagnosed patients could reduce the incidence of microvascular disease. And they also showed epidemiological data to suggest that um, if we could get the glucose really tight, then we might reduce macrovascular disease as well. And indeed, if you look at this forest plot, you can see that the UK PDS at the end of the study showed a, a trend towards reduced or caused mortality. And indeed, they also showed a reduced uh, incidence of myocardial infarction, which just failed to reach statistical significance. Although in the uh, additional 10-year uh, follow-up, they demonstrated that it did. So the hypothesis was that if you could really get glucose down, then you would reduce heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular mortality. And so three large trials were undertaken um, and which were published uh, in the early 2000s. I was involved with the advanced trial and indeed it was a global multi-center study which involved uh, patients from India. Uh, and uh, we tried to get the glucose down to around 6.5%. It was very challenging, um, but you can see in this study which involved uh, over 6,000 patients, at the end of the trial, although there was a very modest trend to reduce or cause mortality, it didn't reach significance. The VADT was undertaken in North America. It was a much smaller study. And here you see that the trend, if anything, uh, was in the opposite direction. In other words, there was a, a non-significant increase in mortality. But it was the ACCORD trial, a, a North American study, uh, in high and patients with high risk of cardiovascular disease, where glucose was very, very tight, they managed to achieve an A1C of below 6.5% early on. These patients had multiple uh, treatments with uh, multiple injections of insulin. And instead of going through the full five years, uh, the Data Monitoring and Ethics Committee stopped the study after three because there was a consistent increase in mortality, as you can see in this slide. 
So as a result, if we combine all these, you can see that intensive glycemic control doesn't seem to have any effect on all cause mortality. And yet hypoglycemia seems to have been involved. Uh, on this slide, you can see the incidence of severe hypoglycemia in the three trials. And you'll note that advance, which if anything showed a trend towards reduced mortality, there was a fairly modest rate of severe hypoglycemia. Hy severe hypoglycemia being defining as needing the other help of another person for recovery. VADT had slightly higher rates, but you can see that Accord had really a huge increase in severe hypoglycemia, unsurprising considering how intensive uh, the treatment was. And so perhaps this was uh, related and it was the hypoglycemia that was causing the trouble because of course it might've been due to other things. It might've been due to medication. It might've been due to chance. Um, so we did uh, an investigation, a post hoc analysis of our data, which we published in the New England Journal back in 2010. And what we did was to divide the patients um, between, uh, you know, the 10 or 11,000 uh, who had no severe hypoglycemia, the fairly small number who had severe hypoglycemia, you'll see it's just 231. Uh, and we looked at the difference in all kinds of outcomes. Uh, and you'll note that for major macrovascular events, microvascular events, death from any cause and cardiovascular disease, those who experienced severe hypoglycemia had really quite a significant risk of experiencing these outcomes. And so you might say, well, they clearly proved that hypoglycemia is causal. And yet we also looked at non-cardiovascular uh, events such as respiratory disease, gastrointestinal uh, problems, which I think we'd all agree are very unlikely to have been caused by hypoglycemia. Uh, and we therefore concluded that though it was possible that severe hypoglycemia contributed to these adverse outcomes, it might merely be a marker of vulnerability to such events, something we call confounding by association. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's shown on this slide, it could be that hypoglycemia is indeed causal, in other words, a risk factor, or merely a marker identifying those who are vulnerable, likely to die, uh, and of course, at the same time, then experience hypoglycemia as a side effect of treatment. And ever since then, there's been uh, an ongoing controversy for those who believe it's absolutely causal, and for those who believe it's nothing of the sort. Uh, and you'll see many papers in the literature, some of which we have contributed to uh, in this ongoing discussion. Um, and it is quite challenging to establish a causal relationship between outcomes and exposure uh, when you think something's caused potential harm. And as somebody once said when I presented at the ESD, you, you have to do a randomized controlled trial to prove that. But of course, that is ridiculous. You clearly cannot do a randomized controlled trial and deliberately uh, randomize patients to have severe hypoglycemia. I think you'd agree that the ethics committee would not allow that. And indeed, it is not a feasible study to do. Uh, so can we still demonstrate it? Well, I think everybody in this audience knows that smoking is a cause of cancer and there's never been a randomized controlled trial to prove it. And so epidemiologists have come up with a number of factors which you need to look at if you're trying to establish causality. These include mechanism of the association, the strength of the association, uh, consistency, how specific the changes are in relation to that, whether there's a temporal pattern, in other words, does hypoglycemia come before the event? Uh, and in particular, is there a dose response relationship? Now I could spend two hours telling you uh, uh, and showing you the evidence, but I haven't time to do that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about um, some of the potential mechanisms and pathophysiological effects, because there are good mechanistic reasons why uh, hypoglycemia might cause uh, these adverse cardiovascular events. We know that hypoglycemia uh, increases cardiac workload and heart rate. Uh, and um, we also know that it causes a prothrombotic state. I'm gonna show you evidence very shortly. 
uh, hypoglycemia has effects on uh, endothelial uh, function and causes dysfunction. There's evidence for inflammation. And as everybody, again, in this audience know, the activation of the sympathetic adrenal nervous system uh, by, uh, not only uh, has effects on, on myocardial oxygen demand, uh, but it also causes hypokalemia. And as again, as I'll show you, it causes QT prolongation. So as a group of investigators who've been uh, devoted to this uh, subject for the last 10, 15 years, I want to just share with you some of the challenges. So you can clearly bring people into uh, the lab and induce hypoglycemia, and do, we do that. But you can't involve those at the highest risk. We can't bring people in who've had a myocardial infarction and make them hypoglycemic. It's unethical. We cannot go very low in terms of glucose. You can't really drop glucose below 45 milligrams per deciliter in the lab. Uh, and you have to address prediction and downstream. And so if you do an event, um, you're not going to see somebody die very likely with your 10 to 15 individuals. Um, so you have to think about how you can predict uh, or be convincing in terms of your studies. In clinical studies, even in people at high risk, cardiac events are rare. Severe hypoglycemia is relatively unusual in people with type 2 diabetes. It certainly occurs. But again, if you pick a sample of 50 or so, not many are going to go hypoglycemic in a few weeks. Uh, and until recently, CGM hasn't been good enough. So let me just show you a, a couple of examples. These are studies conducted by Elaine Chow, who's a very gifted PhD student working with us. Uh, and what she did was to take people into the laboratory. They had type 2 diabetes. Uh, I should emphasize that they weren't at high cardiovascular risk, but she uh, clamped them at a glucose of around 45 milligrams per deciliter. And you can see the design of the study. The clamp is shown in orange. But what we also did was to bring the patients back a day later and a week later, because we wanted to see whether these effects were um, persistent. Uh, and you'll notice that we uh, robustly did two studies, one hypoglycemia at 45, uh, and two, a clamp at euglycemia. And the reason we did a control with euglycemia is we know insulin itself has anti-inflammatory actions, and we clearly had to control for that. So we're comparing hypoglycemia induced by clamp with euglycemia uh, maintained with glucose during the two hours of the clamp. So let's look at the first one, uh, which is the clot maximum absorbance. And you'll notice uh, we demonstrated that blood clot, uh, when removed, blood when removed, the patient would clot, uh, and its thickness was a little bit greater with hypoglycemia. That's the dotted line. That's the clamp. Uh, the solid line is the euglycemia. Uh, but it didn't reach significance. And if we'd finished the study, then we would have concluded no difference. But you can see uh, when we followed the patients onto a week, we were now seeing significant differences. On the other hand, if you look at clot lysis, the time taken for blood to clot, you'll notice that even at the end of two hours, blood has altered its character, the ability to clot, and is now taking longer to dissolve after hypoglycemia. If we look at fibrinogen levels, you'll see there's absolutely no difference at the end of the two hours, but bring the patient back one week later, and they're now showing some quite significant effects. Uh, and finally, again, if we look at CRP, a marker of inflammation, you'll see that there's no change at the end of the two hours, but uh, a persistent increase in low-grade inflammation a week later. Now, this isn't severe hypoglycemia, and I want to point out that perhaps severe hypoglycemia in the clinical trials that we've been showing is merely a surrogate for repeated hypoglycemia. And could it be that those patients who had severe hypoglycemia were having repeated uh, non-severe events, and that was uh, overcoming the benefit of tight glycemic control, and that was our overall hypothesis. Let's turn now to clinical studies. Again, I haven't got time to show you more experimental data, although we have it. 
So um, there have been case reports of arrhythmias during hypoglycemia, uh, and there are the different types are shown on this slide. So we became interested uh, and we wanted to test the hypothesis that clinical episodes of hypoglycemia could lead to cardiac arrhythmias. And so Elaine uh, then undertook a study uh, to do just that. And we wanted to measure the risk of arrhythmia during clinical hypoglycemia, as well as changes in autonomic function and cardiac repolarization. And if you're interested, you can read our paper in diabetes. So she took 25 individuals at high cardiovascular risk on insulin, uh, and she simply placed ambulatory electrocardiograms and a continuous glucose monitor on them uh, for a period of five days. Now, the first thing I want to demonstrate here is that if we look at the hypoglycemia, which we summarized on the left during the day and one on the night, you can see that there's a very different uh, kind of change. Uh, during the day, it's kind of classical hypoglycemia, if you like. You can see it lasts around 80 minutes. The glucose goes down to just under around 50 milligrams per deciliter on average, quite high error bars, so quite variable. Look at the episodes at night. You can see that they're lasting three times as long. They're really long. Um, and uh, the glucose goes down to lower levels. Uh, and so hypoglycemia during the night is very different than during the day. And I'm happy to explain why that is. And let's look at an example of what we saw. So here's a patient, uh, they go to bed uh, and their glucose is normal. Uh, and around 1 a.m., their glucose drops to around 50 uh, and it stays there, not for one, for two, but for four hours till 5 a.m. What you see here is the electrocardiogram. The QRS uh, has been truncated, uh, but you can see the T wave on the right, which starts off at the night as quite normal. Uh, and you'll notice that at about 3 a.m., the T wave completely flattens and becomes prolonged. And uh, if we look at the QT interval, a measure of cardiac repolarization measured from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave, you can see at the same time, it becomes prolonged. It starts off at a normal level at around 420 milliseconds. And by the end of the night, it's up at 500 milliseconds. That is highly abnormal. Uh, and you'll be aware that long QT intervals in patients with other conditions, particularly ischemic heart disease, highly relevant here, is associated with sudden death. Um, also, we looked at arrhythmias, and you can see that we looked at uh, ventricular ectopics, uh, with the complex ones were statistically different. We looked at atrial ectopics, there was an increase, and we also found this marked increase in bradycardia, uh, and you can see an incident rate ratio, which is pretty high, 8.5. But I want to emphasize that what was really interesting is that the majority of our 25 patients didn't have these. They were confined to two or three individuals. Uh, and we really don't know why those individuals contributed to the rest. Could it be they had autonomic neuropathy? Right. Hey, Dr. Might... Dr. I'm just wondering which hall am I supposed to be, Porbandar or, uh, or Sabarmati? I'm... Uh, Dr. Chowdhury, please, uh, you're interrupting my talk here. <laughs> okay, can I carry on? Sorry. Um, an increased risk of um, bradycardia. Uh, and so it remains unclear why there is an idiosyncratic difference. Uh, and here's an example of a cardiac arrhythmia uh, in somebody with real marked bradycardia. Here they're going along at about 40 beats per minute. Uh, and you'll notice uh, ventricular ectopics, trigeminy. Uh, and I want to emphasize that nobody died in this study. But what it shows is the potential risk, I think, uh, of hypoglycemia. And for those of you who remain skeptical that hypoglycemia can kill, I want to draw your attention to this rather chilling case report uh, and a scan of somebody dying of hypoglycemia. Now, I could have added to the length of my talk and talked about the um, dead in bed syndrome, which is known in type one diabetes, particularly young people, but I haven't got time, but I wanted to show you this slide. 
here's a gentleman, 21 years old, who had a CGM put on him because the week before he'd had a hypoglycemic seizure at home. He's using a pump, as you can see, and his glucose starts off on the day he died at 2.50 uh, and then gradually falls during the day. He then takes exercise marked in purple, uh, but he just misjudges how much food he needs to take and his glucose pops up to around 2.50 again. And during the evening, between eight and midnight, he takes not one, but two, but five boluses of insulin. In other words, he's stacking his insulin, something which we know is really dangerous, uh, and he goes to bed. And during the night, his glucose falls precipitously, uh, and at around 5 a.m., he dies. At autopsy, nothing is found, and the assumption is he's died an arrhythmic death. So I want to finish, and I'm sorry I've had to make my talk so brief, uh, but I was instructed to do so. So the consequences of hypoglycemia, I would suggest, are important in different ways. As everybody, again, has been trained uh, in this audience, we know that repeated episodes of hypoglycemia and tight control will impair counter-regulatory responses, particularly uh, release of uh, epinephrine. Uh, and so this increases our patients to impaired cognition and severe hypoglycemia. The occasional episode in poorly controlled patients, I believe, are associated with powerful sympathoadrenal responses. And these surges in catecholamines could trigger lethal cardiovascular events due to platelet activation or worsening angina, or indeed repeated non-severe events may just accumulate and, and cause atherosclerosis and overcome the benefits of tight control. And finally, prolonged asymptomatic episodes overnight, which I've demonstrated during my talk, and which we showed in that clinical study, uh, increased QT intervals and slow heart rates due to increased vagal tone. And this may be clinically relevant in people with diabetes. In summary, I think that the association is multifactorial. I do believe that there's confounding, but I hope I've shown you evidence which convinces you that at least in part, hypoglycemia can have adverse cardiovascular consequences. Uh, and with that, oh, I want to acknowledge uh, all my co-workers and thank you for your attention and happy to answer uh, any questions.